Our next speaker and the final speaker of this morning's panel is my colleague and co-organizer, Paul Sturton, who is Associate Professor of European Design History here at BGC, as well as editor of our, our in-house journal, um, West 86. Professor Sturton works primarily on architecture and design of the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Britain and Central Europe. And this year, he curated an exhibition and published a catalog on Jan Schicholt and the new typography at our Bard Graduate Center Gallery. And he has a very zachlich title for his talk, no, no messing here, this graphic design of the Bauhaus. And I think I'm, I'm actually very much looking forward to his talk as well, because I feel like there are a number of ways that we kind of have a, have a, a visual sense or, or um, you know, a sense of images from the Bauhaus. And one is certainly the photographs that we've seen. Some of the ones we've seen so far are familiar to us. Some of them are very maybe unfamiliar to us. But I think also the Bauhaus graphic design is a kind of a, a um, it's a communicator in its own right. right? And, it, and, and it has given us a sense throughout this history of, of what, what this image was. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let Paul start talking. Thank you, Freya. Well, as Freya mentioned, uh, earlier this year I curated an exhibition on uh, the new typography, primarily around Jan Chickold. Um, and it's that focus on the broader environment in which uh, modernist graphic design emerged in Germany, which gives me a, a certain view of the Bauhaus. So I hope this concentration on one uh, somewhat uncertain class or studio in the Bauhaus might illuminate some aspects of the Bauhaus in general, but also help to position us or position the Bauhaus in relation to similar developments that were not in either Weimar, Dessau or Berlin. And in that, I'm rather drawn to the fact that there seems to be a, a slight mismatch between what we what I regard as German scholarship on the Bauhaus, as opposed to Anglophone scholarship. Uh, the German scholars have done a lot more, I think, primary research, but they do not prioritise the Bauhaus to the same extent that the British and American scholars do, giving the Bauhaus this special status. And I think that may have influenced some of my approach to this. So what I'm going to be talking about, I hope, is not an anti-Bauhaus rant, but uh, it is nevertheless, I hope, a corrective to the idea that the Bauhaus is an extraordinary institution. Now, as Ty mentioned earlier, uh, we tend to know the Bauhaus and indeed use the imagery of the Bauhaus from their own publications. This has shaped our view of the Bauhaus as much as it was a feature or, let's say, a product of the Bauhaus. And yet it was subject to, or the product of, rather peculiar circumstances. This, I'm sure, will not be the last time that you'll see the Cathedral of Socialism today. <laughs> or indeed the invitation card and announcement for the completion of the structure of the Sommerfeld House, both of which, as we can see quite, quite clearly, relate in many respects to a well-established tradition in German modernist printmaking based on the woodcut. But in fact, the Sommerfeld House is a lithograph imitating a woodcut, which in turn, as we've heard, uh, is to some extent an almost archaic medium which the Expressionists revived. Now, these, these are curiosities, but they've shaped our view of the Weimar Bauhaus in a number of ways, and yet they arose largely through force of circumstances. Because one of the few photographs that we have of the Bauhaus print workshop was in the 1923 catalogue, which, uh, although this exhibition and the catalogue itself was admired by Jan Chichold, as I've written elsewhere, one does wonder what Jan Chichold saw in the teaching of graphic design and printmaking at the Bauhaus, because the equipment that they had was not just primitive, it was, uh, in fact, much of it didn't work. 
uh, they only had three presses of a type which most artist printmakers would have had in their own studios, far or less a college. And as we can see from this, of the three presses, there's a platen press, there is an etching press, and a small lithographic press. Now, in reading through the background to this, Hush Schmidt maintained uh, long afterwards that the Bauhaus had wanted to have much better presses, but that uh, Henry van der Velde owned the presses and that these had been impounded at the outbreak of the First World War because he was a Belgian national and not never returned. Uh, now, Huschmidt no doubt believed that, but it's a slightly more complex story because, in fact, the person who owned the presses was uh, Count Harry Kessler, who had founded the Cranach Press in 1913. Now, Kessler has a somewhat distinguished reputation amongst liberals in Central Europe, uh, although in Germany at the time he was often described as the Red Count. However, at the beginning of in 1919, where after the peace, um, Kessler had re-established the uh, Cranach Press in Weimar, and it was he who owned the presses. He's well known for uh, his collection of French painting, but what's less explicit, all is often confused in this, is that the Cranach Press was almost an entirely an English private press phenomenon. He may have employed Aristide Maillol to produce the illustrations for the famous Eclogues of Virgil, but in fact uh, it was Emery Walker, who had established the press, Eric Gill produced the initial letters and typography of the Eclogues, and the most famous book that they had produced, Hamlet, was illustrated by Edward Gordon Craig, E.W. Godwin's son. So it had a very strong link to the English arts and crafts and private press movement. More to the point, however, in 1919, in his diary, or at least reporting a conversation, Harry Kessler, when asked about the Bauhaus, had said that he would not cooperate with them because it was a nest of communists and Jews. That's not exactly the statements of the Red Count, such as he is well known. And indeed, he very deliberately withheld the presses from the Bauhaus. But there was a very good reason for it, because his own private press was... Uh, moderately successful and he was able to put quite a lot of money into it. Now, this is the only picture I could find of the press workers at the Cranach Press. But if that is the case, this is a colossal number of people working on a handful of hand-printed books. So perhaps he did need the presses and could not put them back to the Bauhaus. Indeed, on the bottom right you can see the Hamlet put together by this committee that is uh, in the uh, picture above, round a table, planning their next, that's obviously a staged photograph, planning their next um, product. Now, there was nevertheless one ongoing link between the Cranach Press and the new Bauhaus, and this was largely through uh, the bookbinder, Otto Dorfner. And Otto Dorfner also emerged from an Anglophile private press tradition of fine bindings. And I think it's quite revealing, actually, to look at the costumes or dress that many of the people are wearing compared to their contemporaries in the various studios of the Bauhaus. Here they are dressed in uh, quasi uh, tradesmen's outfits and very much with the kind of smart, well-turned-out attention that apparently William Morris insisted, and as did the uh, Emery Walker at the Dove's Press. Dorfner continued to work both for the Cranach Press and in the Bauhaus, although he soon gave that up because he also disliked the lax morals and the politics of the Bauhaus, and perhaps understandably in the early to mid-1930s he joined the Nazi Party and uh, indeed uh, worked on a number of important uh, publications for the party. Now this might also explain why 
the for early years of the Bauhaus produce very few uh, innovative uh, print works, except as fine art prints. That those restrictions in terms of the presses um, clearly didn't allow them to produce anything in great numbers. But they did have one stroke of luck. When they reoccupied the buildings of the uh, old um, Kunstgewerbeschule, the um, college which had been run largely by uh, van der Velde, uh, they found a colossal stock of high-quality handmade paper and Japanese paper. So what would you do with that? But of course, given the limited press uh, opportunities, the Bauhaus Mappa series, of which they planned five and completed four and a half, a project which was intended to raise money for the Bauhaus, but in fact didn't cover its costs. But it was a very good um, and a perfectly reasonable project. It doesn't come close to the idea of graphic design, however. Artists' prints were to meet at an expanding market, particularly in Germany, for limited edition prints. Other than that, the only printed material produced by the Bauhaus was for their own lectures and events. And I'm showing two famous examples here, the uh, one of a series, or two of a series, of posters and designs for the famous 1923 um, exhibition, which had, of course, not only shown the house am horn, but indeed presented a much more coherent and modernist, or for want of a better word, let's say constructivist view of the Bauhaus and its activities. And this is, of course, like so many other aspects of the Bauhaus, uh, the moment where many of the forms and ideas or policies and education or pedagogic principles were brought to the foreground. Because it was in this catalogue that Laszlo Mohoy Nudge coined the term de neue typography, which would come to define a whole movement in graphic design over the next decade and beyond. Now, it's somewhat odd that uh, Mohoy Nudge should uh, take such an interest in this, because all that he had done in terms of printing before this essay was print a series of lino cuts. Basically, lino cuts were, of course, almost the easiest thing to produce. They had been developed largely for teaching printmaking to children in Vienna. So Mahoynaj's knowledge of printing, and particularly typography, was minimal. He could not set type, and he had no experience of printing on uh, anything more than a platen press. Nevertheless, this is a very important essay. It did in define the movement which emerged from it. And indeed, the young Jan Chichold visited the exhibition and said later that he found both the essay and the exhibition an inspiration. Now, I think that he did, he was only saying this in the 1960s, by which time the Bauhaus had become an international phenomenon. Because clearly someone like Chekold, who'd served a full apprenticeship as a typographer, sign writer and a lithographer, can only have looked on the technical equipment of the Bauhaus with scorn. Now, this is also one of the clearest statements of the Bauhaus move away from the more expressionist forms of the early works towards a type of international constructivist modernism that many of uh, Mahoy Nudge's contemporaries traced specifically to Russia. Did you can see it in the layout of Mahoy Nudge's interior uh, pages, which you can see in this bottom left, and indeed in the organisation of the type. The cover was by Herbert Bayer, at that stage still a student, uh, and this one of his uh, earliest uh, printed um, examples of his work. It's also possibly the first thing that Mahoy Nudge did in the Bauhaus since this was printed uh, approximately two months after he was employed. So it's really quite an important landmark but it provided a basis for the rebranding of the Bauhaus which 
as was recognised at the time, was a relatively easy thing to do through print. Because, of course, the first thing you can do is change the letterheads. And indeed, the Bauhaus changed its letterheads almost every few months over the next few years, uh, producing endless variations on the rectilinear forms, the asymmetry of the design and the use of black and red which at this stage, as I said, had been increasingly associated with uh, El Lissitzky, who, of course, visited the Bauhaus around this time. Now, the other area where the Bauhaus uh, rebranded itself was, of course, through the Bauhaus book series, which appeared in 1925 and running right up to 1930. But that was not printed nor published through the Bauhaus. They kept their name on it, but it was printed through Albert Langen and his own presses and uh, outsourced printing from uh, Munich. So again, this has a very strong and distinctive design, but it does not emerge from the teaching within the Bauhaus at that stage. And this is something of a paradox because, of course, between 1923 and 1926, there was a revolution happening in German graphic design, partly through uh, technological improvements, but also through the burgeoning theoretical debate about the future of print and photography as a medium to change society as much as to communicate with a mass audience. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to show you that earlier while we were talking. But um, Now, the touchstone for this was elemental typography or elementar typography, a special issue of the uh, book printers trade union journal, Typografische Mitteilungen, which had been handed over to the 23-year-old Jan Chekold, and he took the opportunity not to promote his own work, but indeed to uh, pull together what he saw as the strands of a new form of pictorial or printed graphic design uh, that he observed in a range of disparate new innovative designers. Above all, El Lissitzky, but I think if you look at some of the names that he mentions down on the right-hand side, you'll recognise Nathan Altman, Otto Baumberger, Herbert Bayer, Max Burkhardt, El Lissitzky, Mahoy Nudge, Molnar Farkas, Maltzan, Kurt Schwitters, Mark Stamm, and at the bottom is Ivan Chickold. He changed his name to Ivan after he met El Lissitzky. And indeed, during this period, he very actively saw the sources of the new graphic design as emanating from communist Russia. Uh, there's some debate as to whether he was a member of the Communist Party. It's a bit like uh, the Mahoy nudges. They found this embarrassing at later in later stages. But uh, whether he was or not, they were certainly fellow travellers. Now, in the uh, Typografische Mitteilungen, Chickold had put forward very simple, clear statements about what the revolution in graphic design would be. And he confirmed this three years later in a much more popular book the, uh, <coughs> called Die Neue Typographie, where he had laid out unbreakable rules for the principles of modernism. Asymmetry, sans serif type, and photographic illustration. I'm putting up a Max Burkhardt's alongside it, partly because I think it's just an outstanding poster, uh, but it's also a very good demonstration of the diversity and range of forms within that very rigid programme of modernist design. In fact, the fourth of those exclusively lowercase letters was only taken up by a handful of people, but uh, it did nevertheless appeal to uh, many on the left wing of the modernist environment who saw lowercase letters as a democratic form free of the so-called aristocracy of capitals. Now, when 
Chekhov was preparing this, he was quite open about the fact that he was not the initiator of these ideas. He was pulling together ideas, theories and practices which were already becoming current in the print world of uh, particularly Germany during this period, but he also identified it in the Netherlands and further afield. And indeed, by 1925, there was already a plethora of theoretical writings. As early as 1919, El Lissitzky had gone into print about the role of typography to change society. So that by 1923, 24 and 25, there's a body of theoretical discourse, including, uh, as we can see here, in copies of Mertz, the magazine edited and produced by Kurt Schwitters, which there were three issues directly devoted to typo reclam or uh, advertising design. There's also writings and indeed uh, publications by Theo van Duisburg and a range of others. So that when Chickold was promoting this in 1925, at a time when the Bauhaus still only has three hand presses, uh, the um, debate had moved on from uh, what might have been regarded as the early stages. Now, the key to much of this was El Lissitzky, who, of course, was resident in Germany, or at least in Central Europe, for, m many, for much of this period. He had, of course, uh, married a German uh, woman, or at that stage they were still only living together. But, uh, and this had connected him throughout the Netherlands, the Bauhaus and indeed to a range of other Central European uh, artists, designers. And indeed, Eldesitsky had been working in a manner which Chekhold and indeed Herbert Bayer would acknowledge as the way forward, to quote Chekhold, for somewhere like about six to seven years by the time that the Bauhaus was beginning to catch up with this. Now, the Bauhaus changed much of its emphasis in this, of course, as with everything else, when they moved to Dessau and were told through Gen Hust Schmidt that they were able to equip the uh, print workshop in the basement with a range of new presses. I've not been able to verify much of this and in fact all the description of the presses is extremely vague and the f one photograph I've seen of it gives very poor indication of what was actually available for teaching typography, printing, or indeed the full range of letterpress, lithography, and above all, photo litho. But the central figure in this, and indeed any consideration of graphic design at the Bauhaus, has to be Herbert Bayer, who was one of the earliest to take up the ideas put forward by Chickold and El Lissitzky, and indeed uh, applied it in a range of forms. Now, I'm only going to show you these. I'm not going to analyse them. You're already very familiar with Bayer's uh, works. These are external projects for him. Uh, this is the catalogue for uh, the Fagus Shoelast Company, which uh, was one of his most comprehensive and most successful exercises in corporate identity. But he did also produce a range of posters for outside activities. But what's quite noticeable, despite Bayer's success, or let's say uh, the critical uh, success that he enjoyed, he had hardly any commissions which were not directly related to the Bauhaus. Fagus employed Gropius as their advisor, or not, he had not only designed the building, but they retained Gropius to advise on most aspects of the firm's work. And of course, he would recommend Herbert Bayer for this. But the same goes for a range of other, his other most innovative work. It's mostly Bauhaus projects. This is not a criticism, I'm just pointing out that Bayer, I don't think from his own writings, he was not looking to develop uh, an independent graphic design practice. 
but instead content to work within the Bauhaus, producing a range of works uh, which are in their own way rather important or very interesting essays in the new typography. And if I go through them, you can see how he elaborates the repertoire of forms and the unbreakable rules which Kurt Schwitters, Jan Schichold and El Lissitzky had laid down about sans-serif type, asymmetry and the use of photography as the principal uh, mode of illustration. <coughs> What's quite interesting in all this is that advertising design or graphic design, it doesn't really have a, a singular term in Germany at this period. The term graphic design was coined in America, in the US only in 1923. So what we find in Germany is that there's a, a range of terms that relate to what will become graphic design. And you have to often reinterpret them when you look at how things were taught. But it appears that it wasn't until 1927 that the Bauhaus introduced a class on reclam. And indeed, Bayer wrote to Jan Chickold, basically saying, at last, for the first time, I'm able to teach Reclam, which I would call uh, advertising design or graphic design. This is very late in the day. A debate which has been going on for almost a decade and has been in print for six, seven years and uh, <coughs> also advertised through the main trade journals throughout Germany that J the Bauhaus is coming round to teaching this. Now it's at, actually at this point which uh, Bayer indeed leaves the Bauhaus because he, like a group of others who are strongly associated with uh, Gropius, chose to leave when Gropius stepped down in 1920. As far as I can see, the course in Reclam lasted one year. <laughs> And indeed, over the previous four years, looking, albeit from the outside, it seems as if the print course changed the curriculum each year. Now, it just uh, I don't think that would be conducive for the development of a, a trained cadre of people to go out into the design world. And indeed, we can see from this that Herbert Byers late work indeed shows his departure from the central principles of the new typography towards a much more quirky, experimental and more highly coloured and elaborate style. This on the top is one of his last works, the invitation for the Bauhaus White Party. But the piece below it, which I've always liked, uh, is indeed his uh, visiting card or an advertising postcard, which also, as you can see, has a cross through the Dessau Bauhaus, <laughs> implying he's left Dessau and he's moved to Berlin. But look at that photograph of himself as a serious graphic designer. It actually, if anything, it indicates this move towards what we might describe as surrealism and a highly coloured form of uh, photo montage, which is quite different from the mainstream of Elisitsky, Chickold and the great range of other new typographers. And this, of course, is a, tradition, a, a style that he develops during the 1930s, and some of which we saw in Paul Bett's talk last night, because unlike most of the others, uh, Herbert Bayer, sorry, uh, when Chickold published his The New Typography, he received a great many letters of support. But Herbert Bayer's letter, wrote by, when he wrote to him, says, I really enjoyed the book. It's very useful and it's extremely needed. But why do you have to go in for all that political ranting? The New Typography does not need political justification, which I think when we look at the fact that Bayer was the only uh, figure in this entire circle I'm looking at who was able to work continuously through the Nazi period. But I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, this, when, while I'm raising doubts, I hope, about the 
idea of graphic design at the Bauhaus. One way that we might think about this is also to see what other colleges were doing. And this is, again, where I feel I'm perhaps closer to some of the German scholarship that goes into this, which doesn't always see the Bauhaus as a unique institution. While the, um, the Bauhaus was indeed struggling with many of these uh, issues around print, the new graphic design language, other colleges were throwing themselves much more enthusiastically into this new world of print typography and, for want of a better word, politics for that matter. I and mean, if we take, for example, the college in Magdeburg, and there's about five colleges which are central to the development of uh, modernist graphic design. Essen, Bielefeld, Magdeburg, Frankfurt, and to a lesser extent, the Ryman School in Berlin. But Magdeburg's a particularly interesting one because it, like a number of, uh, like the Bauhaus, had seen an amalgamation between the uh, Handwerkschule and the uh, Fine Art School. And indeed, what had been a local trade college underwent something of a change uh, during this period. It was also advised by Bruno Taut, who sat on their committee and acted in effect as chairman. And it was Bruno Taut who had put forward Johannes Maltzan as the teacher of graphic design as early as 1923. And Maltzan quickly made a reputation for himself as one of the finest exponents of the new typography. These give you some indication of the work that he produced while he was in Magdeburg. <clears throat> also, as we've heard, the uh, Bauhaus was constantly running into problems with the local authorities. But <clears throat> the college in Magdeburg had very good relations with the local mayor. who was quite happy to uh, support these developments if there could be an application for local industry. And we can see how uh, Maltzan produced posters, graphics, corporate identity and a range of other advertisements and print media for local events, local businesses. And he was completely committed to the ideals of this. This is his letterhead on the bottom right-hand side. So if you received a letter from him, or indeed his bill, you would also receive a rather tub-thumping statement about what, why graphic design is important for the modern world. These things were also greatly improved when in 1925 the somewhat traditional uh, director was replaced by Wilhelm Defke. Now, Defke has been somewhat uh, stigmatised, uh, partly because he's often completely wrongly associated with someone who developed the swastika symbol. It's nonsense. So, uh, but uh, Defke did have a reputation as a logo designer and a poster designer for many years, long before this development. And he quickly moved to the centre of the, this relationship between the civic authorities and the school, working to uh, design buildings, to design posters, and indeed to uh, fully immerse himself in the... Uh, activities of the area. And Defka gave Maltzan complete freedom to redesign the entire curriculum. They came up with a programme where rather than teaching the full range of crafts and arts, they, they had four streams. Furniture, ceramics, textiles and graphics. Everything else was left out of this. And Defka was an extremely supportive uh, uh, director during this period. So that when Maltzan left and moved to Breslau in 1928, he appointed as his successor Walter Dexel. Now Dexel had an interesting relationship with the Bauhaus. He had studied there for one year, but he was one of the defectors who 
left the Bauhaus and aligned themselves with uh, Theo van Dusburg, who ran private or separate classes. But Dexel was an extremely good replacement for Maltzan, also a completely committed new typographer who had already demonstrated great skill in the handling of type and negative space in a series of posters, handouts, cards and general adverts for the Kunstverein in Jena. He'd also produced some of the finest demonstrations of a pure typographic modernist design in these works in Magdeburg, which again indicates the extent to which the lecturers or teachers in the art school could be completely integrated with local industry. Now let's look at one other example. This is the Städelschule in Frankfurt, one of the oldest art colleges in Germany, established in 1817. But again, after the First World War, it was reorganised under Fritz Wichert and Ernst May to be a unified fine art and craft and design school, albeit in the older traditional buildings. Of course, with Ernst May, he wanted to enlist the the activities of the college to the larger project of Das Neue Frankfurt, this bid to reinvent Frankfurt as a centre for modernist design and, for want of a better word, socialist change in society. And he enlisted alongside this the absolutely brilliant brother and sister team of the uh, Greta and Hans Lestikoff Greta was the photographer, Lestikoff was the typographer. They redesigned or they established the design of the journal Das Neue Frankfurt, which was distributed to the uh, residents and also put on sale uh, in Frankfurt during this period. The, other, the first person that had been employed to teach typography was Paul Renner, probably the greatest type designer of the Weimar period. And he had developed, while he was in Frankfurt, the, so, uh, the uh, typeface known as Futura. This was commissioned by the Bauer Foundry in Frankfurt and becoming the new or the go-to sans-serif typeface for all of the uh, all of the modernist designers during this period. Renner left in 1925 to join and took Jan Chichold to Munich to establish a new national college of printing and design. And his replace, their replacements were Willy Baumeister, who, another proponent of the new typography, working primarily for arts and crafts organisations, but demonstrating, again, the purest principles of these new techniques. Now, this put places like Frankfurt and indeed Magdeburg, Essen, Bielefeld and the like at the forefront of these new ideas, building them into a curriculum which was also matched by heavy investment in presses and such like. But this group were also creating a network which would operate independently of their regional colleges or uh, employers and, and associates. And this was set up largely by Kurt Schwitters, the organisation known as the Ring Neue Werbegestalter, the Ring of New Advertising Designers. All of the people I've mentioned so far were members of the Ring. Johannes Moltzan, Walter Dexel, Willy Baumeister, Hans Lestikoff, Jan Chickold, Kurt Schwitters, Elisitsky was a visiting member. And in that context, the Ring wanted to create an umbrella organisation that would unite the modernists throughout Central Europe. And it's very interesting. As I've, they wrote to the Bauhaus to join this association. And the, asking that they could participate in Bauhaus exhibitions and that the Bauhaus 
projects would be promoted through the Ring's exhibitions. And this was the rather high-handed, dismissive reply that I suspect Herbert Bayer sent, I'm not sure. But either Bayer or Schmidt basically said, no, we, we don't want to get involved in that sort of thing. And the Ring members who were already somewhat suspicious of the Bauhaus, which they regarded as a dilettantish organisation that was not prepared to engage with the new principles of printing, photography, or what uh, came to be known as title photo in this period. Now, what's emerged from the from Dutch scholars who've brought this together is that they're in the Stedelijk, they have the letters that the Ring members sent to Kurt Schwitters when they read this report. And they're all anonymous. So we don't know who said this. But having been rebuffed by the Bauhaus, there's a ring of uh, <laughs> very rude comments, which in a way demonstrates that the Bauhaus, to many graphic designers, was not seen to be at the core of innovation or indeed participating in what they saw as a larger mission to change printed matter and change society. And it's perhaps interesting that uh, two years later, when the principal exhibition and survey of modernist graphic design in Germany would be uh, published, the so-called Gefeselter Blick Capture Glance, which was organised in 1929 and published in 1930, there's only one person from the Bauhaus included, and that's Maholi Naj, who had maintained contacts with Chickold, Schwitters and the rest. No other Bauhaus graphic designers were seen to be worth joining in the survey of the, mo the most advanced modernist graphic design in Germany and Switzerland. The Bauhaus occupies a curious position in all this, and perhaps in terms of graphic design, the Bauhaus may be seen to be a participant, but certainly not a pioneer or at the forefront of these innovations. Thank you. <laughs>